Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another service from SABC Christchurch. We have an exciting service for you guys today. For today, we have several praise and worship songs, then followed by an inspiring message. After the message, we have a testimony on someone knowing, coming to know Jesus, so sit back and enjoy.
searching every heart I worship you I worship you You are here Healing every heart I worship you I worship you You are here Turning lives around I worship you I worship you You are here Mending every heart I worship you I worship you Don't you just love hearing how the, the, what we know in our head gets down to the heart, you know, and people have that experience of God, which makes all the difference. When heart and head come together, the, the power and the presence and the direction and the infilling of Christ just happens. And, and if it hasn't happened for you, just keep going for it. Keep, keep, uh, if it had, I mean lately. If it hasn't happened for you lately, just keep Keep seeking God and, and worshipping Him and letting those times happen. And when they happen, don't stop. It's a secret. 
This is how you get more. Don't stop. Let it happen. Stay on the floor if you're on the floor. Stay in the chair drinking your coffee. And let his love touch you. It'll change things on the inside. Hey, I want to I speak um, and just say that sometimes things aren't what they actually appear. I, I, I read a story about this woman, a redhead. She goes to the doctor and she says, my body's in pain anywhere I touch. My body, it aches. And the doctor goes, impossible, but show me. So she gets her finger and she touches herself here and, and screams. And then she touches her elbow and screams. And then her leg and her knee and screams. And the doctor's just looking at her like this. And he goes, you're not a redhead really, are you? No, I'm a blonde. He goes, I thought so. Your finger's broken. <laughs> I want to speak again on ident our identity in Christ. This is a series that I've been running for a long time now, but coming back to it often. And th at the moment, we're in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're basically looking at the whole chapter, but we're looking um, mostly at the very end of the chapter that's there. But if we don't know who we are in Christ, the devil will trick us and tell us all sorts of things that aren't actually true. So tell someone around you who you are in Christ. Start with something like, I am, and then put another thing that is true of you in Christ. Like, I am loved. That was one of the first things that I preached on. Take a risk. There's no wrong answers. Good. Great to hear some, some words coming out there. Things like, I am loved, I'm a son, I'm a daughter of God, um, I, I'm adopted by him, I'm forgiven of all my sins, I'm saved. As Leslie said, I'm going to heaven. Um, I'm accepted, I'm heard. And the more we know who, the, who we are in Christ with just these little phrases, then the more we become. We will pump up on the inside because God's truth gets in and is living there. And today I want to do part two on this one. I am a forgiver of people. So turn to someone you love and say, I am a forgiver of people. And if you're not sitting next to someone you love, just do the best you can. <laughs> All right, try this one. Say to them, I am forgiven, so therefore I can forgive you. Try that. Here's another one, but this one's even harder to say, but it's the same, it's the same thing. I will seek to be unoffendable. Have a go. Say it out. Let it come out of your mouth. Now, last time when I preached on this uh, first part of the series, I, I shared how I fell out with my best friend. And he was a guy who was best man at my wedding. And, uh, and, and he was my surfing buddy for over a decade, and he was my ministry partner. But I lost five years of my life's friendship with this man because I got offended. And, and I didn't know how to get free. And this is what can happen for so many of us. I found there was an energy of hurt that intensified and didn't diminish over time because I let all sorts of things that I was saying in my head but wasn't saying to him but I let them go round and round and round, and they became my reality, and it got worse, not better. Have you ever fallen out with anybody? Does anyone come to mind? Have you, have you, have you been offended by someone? What comes to mind? Don't say it. Um, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> keep it in. Keep it in. But have you ever fallen out with someone? At my, at my, at my um, brother-in-law's 40th birthday, we, we were invited. The whole family was invited. He was having a wonderful party going on. And then we, at last moment, found out that if we wanted to bring our kids, we couldn't come till 4 o'clock. Everyone else arrived early, maybe around midday. It's a long time ago now. 
I got so offended when I found out that his sister came with her ch- and her husband with their children, and they didn't get us to leave. Man, I got offended. Have you fallen out? Has something happened that has just gotten under your skin and you got offended? Well, I want to say to you a couple of things. It's normal. It's life. It happens. But we don't have to stay offended. This is what Jesus wants us to know. You know, the greatest instrument that Jesus used to rescue the world was forgiveness. And for Jesus, you think about this, it was really difficult to use this instrument, to have it actually in his hand. It was drawn out over 33 years away from heaven. It was costly because his life ended in torture. But he rescued billions of people down through previous generations that had died, right through to our generations and the generations beyond us as well. It was open, forgiveness and salvation was open for them because Jesus rescued them through this costly, hard thing to do called forgiveness. It's a super weapon to release us from Satan's schemes and plans that he puts around a person's life. And he's given it, given it to us to use too. And Paul didn't see Jesus use it, but he did see Stephen. And he watched Stephen forgive him as well as the others that were there as they murdered him and threw the rocks and smashed his head open and all his lifeblood and his consciousness gone. But the last words out of his mouth were, I forgive you all. God, don't hold this against them. And he would have gone to bed night after night after night after night thinking, what happened there? How? How? What is this thing that Christians have called forgiveness? So he's writing about something that he's personally acquainted with, even though the Holy Spirit is is, um, revealing through him to be able to write it. They're, They're inspired words, but they're coming through his memory banks as well. And this whole chapter in Ephesians chapter 4 is saying this is how we're to live when we get hurt in life or in the church. And actually he's speaking about when you get hurt in the church in this chapter that's there. And dealing with our hurt through forgiveness is one of the ways we grow. It could be the major way we grow. Someone in the prayer meeting this morning said, when the heat comes on our life and we walk through that, that's the time that we grow. And it starts in in, in verse 2 and 3. It says, a mature Christian looks like this. Anyone got a name to be a mature Christian? Come on, guys. Do you want to stay a baby and a child? Anyone want to be a mature Christian? Come on. This is all doable. This is all doable. I've walked through it. You've walked through it. If it happens again, we'll walk through it again. But we have to have an attitude that that, that understands that God wants to take us to maturity. And it says, this is a mature Christian. Be completely humble. Can you think of anyone in the Old Testament who said, I'm the most humble man on the whole earth? What was his name? It was Moses. And he wrote it himself. I've often thought that's a very unusual, humble thing to write. (laughs) But it was true of him. He was humble. He was mature. Be completely humble and gentle. Be be patient. Bearing with one another in love. In other words, when someone messes you up, annoys your day, rocks your world, be humble towards them. Put up with them. Especially if it's someone in the church. Don't give them an earful. Don't mouth off to them. Don't tell everyone they're a jerk. Be humble. Be gentle. This is what mature Christianity is. The second thing he says is make every effort to to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. See, when you become mature, those on the journey of maturity, because we get saved in a day but sanctified in a lifetime, so we're all on this journey. True? Stay with me, friends. Don't, Don't log out. 
Saved in a day, but sanctified in a lifetime. And when we're going on this journey, a mature person will absolutely care for the unity of the Spirit in the body of Christ, in the local church. They won't try to break the spirit, the spirit of unity. They won't try to disrupt it. They'll try to care for it and stop anyone else by holding them to account, by asking the truth of people, speaking the truth in love. They'll hold people to account of people who are seeking to break the bond of unity and peace that's over a local church. So there's no allowance for gossip and factions in our handling of offence out in the world or the family or and, and, um, in business, in your career, or in the church. An immature Christian is one that the Bible in that passage in Ephesians chapter 4 calls a child. They'll be the opposite. They'll be arrogant. They'll say, I'm right. I know best. They'll have control issues, wanting to control things. And they'll be willing to break the unity in the body of Christ and the church for their own agenda. Because they know best. They know what should happen. And sadly, the Bible in this passage that we have here, I won't, well, it, actually, you can read it as I'm going through it um, while it's there, it says there are some people who will actually cause splits and pit people against others and create church arguments. Just as we do in family arguments, they just spring up. But, but Paul is saying, don't do this. Grow up. You know, this church has had a number of times like this in its past. And the devil had a field day in this church prior to us doing something called setting your church free um, 23 years ago, where people would try to just put a wedge in and break the unity of the, of the spirit that's there. Um, one church secretary of this church, who was a really nice guy, stopped paying a previous pastor of the church for several months. He just stopped paying his, his salary, his stipend. Obviously, they had a relational issue between the two of them. And when Newton Dodge found out about that, he sacked the church secretary and wrote the check straight away and renewed it. And when I was, we, we were doing the setting your church free, I, I picked up the phone and I rang that person because he was still alive. And I said to him, look, I'm the pastor of St. Albans Baptist Church now, and I know that the church treated you badly, and this is a, when you were here in some instances, and this is one of them. And, and he started crying on the other end of the phone, and he said, I don't want to talk about it, and put the phone down. Such was his pain that was still living. Sometimes we aren't what we think we are or seem to be. There's some nasty stuff that can be within us. And Paul is saying, grow out of it, grow past it, grow up. You don't want that in your family. There would be ways of trying to work something through in a family. Well, we're a family. And we always have to be aware of this and, and make sure that, that we are seeking to forgive and remain as unoffendable as we possibly can. You know, I was walking into church one day and I heard two women speaking and one of them said, I'm not sitting on that side of the church, she's over there. So she went over to the side where she felt comfortable. Offence, bitterness, it gets in. So who are we in Christ? We're people who will forgive, even when stuff happens that somehow we feel shouldn't have happened. We choose to forgive. And we really only have two choices in life when something happens that we don't like. We can become bitter and have a root that winds down of poison into our life, or we can forgive and set ourselves free. And forgiving people is our super weapon. It's the super weapon that creates a loving environment in a family, in a business, in, at school, and in church. Being able to say, I didn't like that, but I forgive you. Even if you say it in your own head. You know, in, in chapter 4, with these verses that are here, let me just take you through it. First of all, Paul talks about what a mature Christian is like. They're really humble. They've probably gone through a lot of brokenness. 
to break down the pride that we have naturally in our lives until we have grace for people and understanding for people. But they're humble people. And they're long-suffering and protective of church unity. And then he talks about there's a giftedness in the church that's for every single person. But he only names the gifts of leadership, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And we've majored in the church in the Western world in the last couple of hundred years on pastor. And we've made pastor kind of everything. But there are actually apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. Um, we all have leadership gifts. And he says these leadership gifts are to allow the church, they'll teach and they'll encourage and they'll allow the church to actually grow and become mature as, um, as people grow up into Christ. But they also give a structure of leadership to be able to say this and not that. And that's what a leader will do. And it can bring maturity to people in Christ. And the reason given in verse 14 is because... Um, there are people who, it says, are deliberately crafty and scheming and deceptive. In other words, they're scheming for their own agenda. This is something they want to have happen. And the leadership have to gently correct such a person if it's not going in the right direction and speak the truth in love. And boy, when you do that, can people get offended. And verses 17 to 24 then goes on to talk about those living in sin and just following the currents that the world sets. And when a leader steps up and as gently as possible raises the issue of the sin in someone's life, boy, can people get offended. So he comes to verse 25 and verse 32, and this is what he says. He says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. He's speaking to the body of Christ about these things. He says, be angry. It's okay to get angry, but don't let it go into sin. And do not let the sun go down on your wrath or give place to the devil. Let him or her who stole steal no longer, but rather let them labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to be able to give to him who has need. And let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Boy, that's hard to do. It's When someone does something bad to you, it's so good to think of all the things you want to say to them. I know this because I fell out with my friend and lived that way for five years. I fell out with my brother-in-law until I forgave him and thought all sorts of bad things about him. And when you've done it, you've thought it too. It's so good. They should apologize. But Paul and Jesus is saying, no, forgive them. Learn what it is to walk as a humble Christian, not an arrogant person saying, this is what they say. Dial back. Got to speak truth into these situations. Let no corrupt word, no slander. Don't cut someone down. And do not grieve <coughs> uh, the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness... Let all bitterness. And then it gives the fruit of bitterness. Bitterness brings wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking or slander. Put those away from you. Oh, yeah. And also the malice. Don't even contemplate going to physically or emotionally pull them down in whatever way you can. But be kind to one another. Sound like Jacinda. Be kind to one another. Church, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Just as God in Christ forgave you. Who are we in Christ? I am a forgiver of people. Do we want it? Do we want to stay kids? Do we want to stay a baby? Or do we want to actually grow up and become a forgiver of people? So what is bitterness? As far as I know, there's only two things in the Bible that are said to have roots. 
One is the love of money. And if the root of the love of money gets into someone, over time they can do all sorts of devious and terrible things, even evil things, and de degrading things to get their money. It has a root that goes down. And bitterness also has a root. But it tells us in the Bible that we have to be very careful because anyone who allows a root of bitterness to go into their heart will spill poison out onto other people and will not only defile themselves, but they will defile others. So wrath, what is wrath? That's when we're irritated when we think of that person. We're agitated when we're around them. We want to be on the other side of the room so we don't have to be close and actually engage with them. We feel our blood pressure, pressure rising when there's wrath which is coming out of this fruit of business. And, and we might even have pain. There could even be fury for what they've done to us internally. You know, I shared uh, last time, I think, how I, 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 for a day I had to shift some plants that my best friend had asked me to shift, and I did it on adrenaline. I mean, and I got to the end of the day and went to sleep and I felt great. Because so much energy, wrath. And we'll often blame the other person for the way we feel. You've made me feel this way. We might not say it to them, but in our head it'll play. And then there's clamor, and that's when our anger can no longer be contained. And we seek to engage with others about that person. Because others need to know. And this is when the bitterness that has, uh, we've allowed to grow into our lives starts to spill out and contaminate others. Because we want to be seen to be right at that, at that moment. And, and we're hurting and harming that person's reputation, either emotionally or physically. Basically, we slander them, which is the next thing that the Bible says is the fruit if we allow bitterness to go down into our hearts. Uh, we're just not to, not to let that actually happen. But slandering is speaking evil of a person. And we go about gossiping about them and telling our side of the story. But there's always two sides to a story, isn't there? But when we slander someone, we only tell our side and we, we vilify the other person. And we paint that person as, as a terrible person. And malice is when we seek to do evil to that person. Um, like not paying the salary, um, to hurt and to destroy them and to dislodge and break the unity of the church, even if, if we might be found out and it hurts our reputation as well. When, when we get to the stage of malice, real terrible, out-of-character kind of actions and, and speech can take place. Now, we read about the fruit of bitterness in our papers every day with the terrible things that, that some t people will do because of bitterness towards someone else. But Paul and God is not addressing the world. He's addressing the church and saying, be careful. This can grow within everybody. Sometimes the cycle of bitterness is very quick. It happens quickly. Other times it takes months and goes on for years. Joseph Lee, who was the evangelist that was praying in, uh, here, when we did the crusade, um, those of you that came would have seen it. There was a person there he called out by word of knowledge who, who had a root of bitterness up for 24 years. And as he prayed for them, they erupted in tears. And there was also a demon that had had a, had a doorway through the bitterness that that person had carried. Because remember it says... Um, be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. So he's saying, look, when, when we get hurt, we need to acknowledge it. It hurts. If someone says, no, you can't do that, and they have authority and leadership, it hurts. If someone does something terrible to you, it hurts. We're allowed to get angry. We're allowed, to, we're allowed to do certain things, and it's good to write some notes so that we can, can help to process that thing. But it says, don't let over 24 hours go before you get your roundup, spiritual roundup out, out and start spraying the bitterness before it actually becomes a root that grows down into our lives. Does that make sense? But look what, at what can happen. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. This is a scripture that I discovered 23 years ago when we were trying to unpack all the terrible things that have been said and done in, the, in this church split that had split this church three different directions, and, and a daughter, another daughter church had happened, and a coup had taken place, and it was a terrible, hurt church when we came here 23 years ago. But also looking at the other ones that Newton could remember, and some of the older members of the church telling us about this happened back in this day, and this happened back in this day. And I discovered the scripture. This is how God sees it. It says of the, the leader or um, uh, the, the leadership of the church, it says, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. Actually, it sounds a lot like those verses that we're looking at in the beginning of this chapter 4, doesn't it? In humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his, the devil's, will. I reckon those are some of the most scary verses in the whole Bible. That good Christian people who don't understand the power of the super weapon of forgiveness, allow bitterness to grow in their heart, and they can go down this terrible fruit train until they're actually doing the work of the devil. Moving on. How can we stop ourselves from becoming bitter? Because God wants us to grow up. It's in the heat of struggling through the emotions that we feel when someone has hurt us. It, it could be rape. Someone has done something absolutely horrific that should never have happened. But they can forgive. But man, is it hard. All these emotions that rise up, and we want the person to be dealt with in this and this and this way. How can we stop ourselves? A few thoughts. Let people you trust speak into your life. Verse 25 says, you know, let a mentor speak the truth in love. And it needs to be someone who's not just going to tell you the things that you want to hear, but someone who you're hopefully in a mentoring relationship who will tell you the truth. Because it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. In other words, speech that tells you something that actually is a need to grow up here. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. In verse 11, uh, it says, speaks about the church leadership. And so the, you can allow the church leadership to speak in love to you as well. Let them speak discerning, even rebuking thoughts lovingly into your life. Because it's one of the aspects of what shepherds are to actually do in a, in a flock. It's one of the things fathers are to do and mothers are to do in a family. Secondly, we can allow ourselves to get angry. Take your angry response as an indication that internally it's time to grow. Oh dear God, you're just indicating there's another growth level. I'm going to take another step in this next week or month or however it longs to really work this actually through. Ask yourself, why are you so angry? Write some notes and go and seek God and ring that mentor. But do it urgently. It's not to be left till the sun's gone down and you're asleep on the next day. And then lean into God and forgive the person. Forgive the person. You know, the development of his nature comes out in the grist of actually doing this stuff. Jesus had to pay a costly, difficult price to be able to forgive. And you probably haven't been hurt very much if you can just go, I forgive you. Now, let's carry on with life. When we're hurt, and the hurt seems to be worse by people that are close to us. If someone on social media sends you a post and you don't have any idea who it is, it's something you can relatively quickly go past. But if someone really close to you that you respect and are walking with sends you a post that has a serve in it, ooh, that's much harder. 
And then the fourth thing is choose not to speak badly of them. Slander and gossip. I'm so glad I didn't slander my friend Mark. What happened between Mark and I and went on for five years involved ended up drawing my wife and his wife into the respective camps. But I never slandered my ex-friend, who is now my good friend. I never slandered him to the other friends that I have. I never tried to make them my team. I never tried to build what the Bible calls a faction, a, a lobby group who will not like that person. And I'm so glad of that because we can stop it at various points along the actual track. And, and fantastically with Mark, some of the friends who, Mark and some other friends that I had didn't know each other, but when we left and weren't the glue in between, they, they found each other too and formed hugely great friendships with this couple. So choose not to speak badly of them. It's not easy to do, is it? Bless the person. Bless the person who's hurt you in some way. Negative feelings and tapes may start to play in your head, and if you allow them to, they will become that root that digs deeper and deeper into our heart. So take patrol and choose to, every time you think of that person and you're starting to see a tape play again, pray for them. Pray for the person. And don't pray for the fire of God to get them and consume them. Pray blessing. If you will pray, God, bless this person, he will pour love for that person into your heart. Many of you know this because you've done it. It's just become normal in your Christian life. But boy, do we walk up the steps of maturity as we actually do this. And however long it takes, if it's a day, great. If it's a week, great. But every time you think of that person, decide, I'm going to pray more for them. Because we've, we've got an enemy called the devil who will, who will do everything he can to cause problems. I remember when we had a, a preacher um, come to Christchurch who has a healing ministry. He said when his family started to get sick, he said to the devil, right, you've gone way too far. I'm not only praying for my family, I'm going to the emergency ward and I'm praying for every person who's injured and going into the hospital as well. Why should the enemy win? And he had stories of people actually getting healed, taking ground from the devil, because the devil's trying to get that worm of bitterness growing deeper and deeper. So pray more. Pray more for people that hurt us. You know what happens then? You all know it. We become the ones that become free. We are designed to walk through life lightly. We are designed to walk through life lightly. And when we won't forgive someone, we're the ones that get bound up. Am I telling you the truth? Yeah. Let me just give you um, a, a couple of things. Um, what, do you, what do you do if, if someone's trying to to um, gossip to you and you realize that it is gossip. Refuse to, to triangle. Just say to them, stop talking. I can see you've got a problem with this person. My advice to you is go to them and talk with them and see if you can sort it out and go often. And if you've, had a, if you've got a story of breakthrough in this area and coming to to um, freedom yourself, share the story so the person goes, oh, I can see the track. I can see what you mean. Show them in the Bible where it is. Four things about forgiveness. It's a decision and a process. That's why when they asked him, Jesus, how many times should I forgive? He said, oh, 70 times seven. And for most of us, forgiving someone who's really hurt us, say you take that rape situation, Forgiving that person and not letting that memory just come flooding back and take over our life. And the devil uses it to build a, a deep root of bitterness in there. That's going to be a process. That might take 70 times. Because there's an emotional energy when someone hurts us to a degree. And when we forgive, the emotional energy drops to here. And when we bless them, it drops a little bit more. But maybe the next day it comes back again. And we have to say, God, I choose to remain forgiving. I'm forgiving again. But every time we forgive a person, the emotional energy that 
that powers through our veins becomes less and less. And it's cancelling a debt owed, it's forsaking revenge, it's leaving justice in the hands of God. And, and, and you know, the, the cool thing is that you can do that even if a crime has been committed and you have to go to the police and report them. And you should go to the police and report them if a crime has been committed in what has been done. But you can still set yourself free from that person's domination over your life in the next months and years to come. And forgiveness is removing the control that some other person's going to have over your life. You're saying, no longer is their name going to loom large in my thinking. No longer am I going to have a troubled sleep because of something that someone said. Look, for that person, 24 years ago, they got hurt in a church. And they'd carried it, and it had cost them. There was energy and possibly there was sickness because there's a link the Bible talks about in Proverbs between uh, the state of our heart and our soul and physical um, sickness that can come. Removing control of that person's name out of our life. And ultimately, forgiveness is wanting good for the offender, not bad. In a church situation, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We might spend a thousand years together in close proximity. And we'll be perfect then. God will deal with all that stuff anyway. But why not, why not sort it out now so that we genuinely want the best for them? And what happens is what I said before. As we bless people, not curse them, who've hurt us, God's love comes into our heart in greater and greater ways. It creates a a cycle that will continue and go on. Four things that it's not. It's not forgetting and denying that something's happening. It's not enabling sin. If, it's, if it is a crime, the police need to be involved. Um, and forgiveness is not trust. When trust is broken, it has to be rebuilt. I've been in church situations where... Uh, Money has been stolen from the church. Trust has to be rebuilt. You don't just, oh, that's fine, back where it was. There has to be a rebuilding. And forgiveness is not reconciliation. Forgiveness is the first step that maybe there can be reconciliation. Both parties have to want it. And Mark and I came to a day where we both said we've been absolute fools. And we forgave each other from the heart and we hugged and we cried. And so much was just released in me um, that I never want to go back into that situation again. But the next step that led towards reconciliation was when a few months later he said to me, why don't you bring your family and come up to the batch for a day where we're holidaying? And a little journey of starting to rebuild, to reconcile, takes place. So, defeating bitterness with forgiveness is doable. But every journey starts with a first step. And I wonder whether that person that I got you to think about it as I began to preach, if there's anything that is not completely forgiven there, you want to start that first step today. Can I ask you for prayer? Maybe you could just put your hands out in front of you. And if everyone does it, then we won't know those who are specifically doing it. And you can just know that between you and God. And I want you just to put that person's name out in front of you. Lord, I pray grace for my brothers and sisters and for myself that, God, we might start the journey with anyone that we are not in good relationship with and right relationship with. Lord, may this tool of choosing to pray blessing on people and forgive them be something that we carry on our tool belt for the rest of our lives. May it make sense in our, in our minds and our hearts 
so that your body, Lord, is a place of harmony and beauty and love and difference and differences of opinion. But Lord, held in a humble and a gentle and a long-suffering way. Because at a core, we know that we have been forgiven by you and we can extend grace to anyone who might offend us. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, just to do your work and to show us how we can continue to break free by forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. I pray for those, Lord, who, who will want to go and actually write a letter or talk with a person and open a dialogue. I just pray for your leading, Father. You, you want reconciliation, not just forgiveness and us being free. Ultimately, you want reconciliation. I pray, God, especially where there's brokenness in the family lines, father to son, mother to son or daughter. God, so many of us did not like our fathers. They might have even died. But God, we can be free of the voice and the hurt and the pain. So I pray, God, that you would just grace us to be able to do this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Who are you in Christ? Team, please come. Hello, I'm Leslie, and today I get to share my story of why I am a Christian. So for me, I grew up in a Christian home. Went to a Christian school, so basically everything I knew was Christian, you know, activities outside of school or church were Christian, and yeah, so Christianity was just normal for me, and I don't actually remember when the first time I gave my life to God was, I just, you know, I just did it because it was normal, it was what you do, so yeah, I don't really remember when it was the first time, I do remember when I was about, probably about 11, I think, just thinking about Okay, this is my parents' faith, basically, but what do I believe? What do I want to believe? And I remember thinking that, well, if you get the end to the, end, to the end of your life and Christianity is like not real and it doesn't really matter what you believed because, you know, it just, just doesn't matter. You kind of go to nothing. But if Christianity is real, we get to go to heaven if we believe. But if we don't believe, go to hell. That didn't sound really good. I didn't like the sound of that option. So I basically became a Christian, or I stayed a Christian, I should say, so that I could get to heaven when I die. And yeah, it was basic. Christianity was basically in fire insurance for me. That was all it was. So I kind of went through life from then, kind of doing all the good Christian things like getting baptized, reading the Bible, trying to pray every now and then. But it was really just for that ticket to heaven. My heart really wasn't in it. <laughs> yeah. And about, probably when I was about 13, 14, I think, my um, mother found out about a youth group that was happening that was running a youth alpha. And they, she kind of said, oh yeah, that sounds good. Why don't you and your brothers go along to that? So we started going along to that. It was, yeah, and that group seemed pretty good. That was... Sorry, this, that was youth, this youth group. And, yeah, later later on we got an opportunity to go to the first um, our first Easter camp with the group. And we thought, oh, yeah, sounds good, we'll go along. And, yeah, we went along and I think it was about the first Saturday or Sunday after one of the meetings, you know, I got kind of just started to feel stirred up in my heart, you know, that God was wanting to do something there, but didn't really know what to do, didn't really want to respond probably and I just remember the the camp dad at the time just brought a whole group of us guys together and just you know said, okay, does anyone want prayer basically? And I knew probably that I wanted it, but didn't want to stick out, didn't want to say anything, which is which is kind of strange considering with this hairstyle I really cannot cannot not stand out but you know I didn't want to want to appear normal so didn't say anything and then he, when no one responded he's like okay that's cool but we might as well pray as a group anyway because you know what was said tonight was pretty cool 
so kind of when we got together and when we started praying you know just God like really moved in my heart and I could just I guess I could just experience his really love for the first time how much he loved me how much he did care for me and you know if any of you experience that you just your just emotions just overflow and you know just start crying and just feeling this I guess this presence of God knowing that he loves you and cares for you is just incredible when that happens and yeah can't remember too much else but then later that night I remembered I was just just talking to Caleb afterwards and I just felt this huge sense of peace like I'm an introvert and can't really especially at that time couldn't really hold long conversations but I had you know this really long conversation with Caleb and I just felt peaceful and calm and you know never felt that way before and yeah now I know that was a feeling of you know God's love he cares for me and yeah ever since then I've kind of stayed being a Christian because I know he loves and cares for me and it's not he's not he's so much more than just a ticket to heaven I know from experience that he loves us cares for us and will come and walk with us on this life yeah on this life on earth and that's you know that's incredible and I've learned because he loves us he can help he sometimes helps pushes us and guides us in directions that we wouldn't have thought going ourselves but when we go in those directions we just have so much fun so much joy so much life and yeah that's why I'm a Christian because I've discovered that one he loves me and two he's going to walk in this journey with me and give me that that confidence and comfort that at times I need and I just encourage anybody that if you haven't felt that you know just ask God and I'm sure he will be able to yeah I'm sure he'll from my experience I'm sure he will do that for you too so yeah that's me thank you bye thanks so much for joining us today and our prayer is that you have sensed God's presence with you whether that be through the worship time, whether that be through the message or the personal story that got shared at the end, but that somehow your heart has resonated with it. And if you would like to let us know how you have been impacted or you would just simply like to get to know us better, you can email us on office at sabc.org.nz or you could go to our website www.sabc.org.nz or find us on Instagram or Facebook and like, like our page or follow us just to kind of keep in the loop of what we're up to here at SABC. Now if you would like to find and join in, in a deeper way with us and would like to give to the ministry here at SABC all the details of how you can follow through with that are going to be on the following slide. Once again, we've loved having you join with us. Hare Rafanel.